Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. It'll be all over by Christmas, some said. Who knew at the start of the pandemic we would still be battling with it some year and a half later? Today's session looks the world's reaction to it, vaccine policies and the uneven approach that has left many countries and millions of people behind. We have two first-rate speakers with us. I, Katarina Katidi is a spokeswoman for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and can talk about how COVID health policies are affecting refugee populations worldwide. Hello, Katarina. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, apologies, everyone, also for our technical difficulties. Uh, in a change to our schedule, we also have Gabriel Scali, a member of the UK's Shadow Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies and a visiting professor of public health at Bristol University. Hello and welcome, Gabriel. Hi, Nicholas. Glad to join you. Thank you very much indeed. Just a brief note to say that Dr. Claire Wenham from the London School of Economics, has, um, who was scheduled to take part in this discussion, was called away at short notice and she sends her apologies. Also listening in, we have Dr. Paul Davis, who some of our members may be familiar with. Paul was until recently the chairperson of one of South Africa's leading medical health charities, the Orem Institute, which does research on global health and infectious disease, notably with HIV and TB, uh, and more recently with COVID. And we'll be coming to Paul a bit later in the program. Um, Gabriel, just to start with you, um, I guess you, you know, one has to say that the rollout of vaccines in and of itself has been a tremendous success, just in terms of finding vaccines that work. And, and then I guess we can come on to the question about global distribution, but it is a great achievement, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure the rollout has been a great achievement, Nicholas. I think uh, the, the, um, the science behind the vaccines and really getting them through that trials phase in super rapid time and safely has been remarkable. And the vaccines have been, uh, I think, far more successful in terms of their effectiveness than we had a right to believe in. And uh, so, so technically, it has been very successful in many places. Not all vaccines have performed well, and a lot of the runners and riders have kind of fallen by the wayside along the way. But those that have come through, uh, and there are still plenty in the pipeline, have been very good vaccines. Rollout, I think that's a different matter, and that's a very, very mixed picture. Yeah. world. Now, uh, you, you're, you're on the shadow sage, as it's called here. Uh, in the UK, um, which is a sort of an alternative voice to the government's own advisory panel. And I know you've been quite outspoken. We'll talk about the UK in, in just a bit, but the focus here really is on the global situation and the disparity between developing nations uh, and you know, developed nations. Um, so just on, on, that, on that point, from that point of view, I mean, there was a sort of breakthrough earlier this year when the White House said it would back the lifting of patents. What's happened with that? That was a tremendous moment, I thought. I thought, my goodness, the world has changed. And when the US said that they would uh, uh, they would support that. So the problem being that actually much of the work on the vaccines has been funded from the public purse across the world uh, or by philanthropic sources. Um, some companies have put their own resources in, but it's been a huge collective effort getting the vaccines as far as they got. When we got to the rollout, uh, it, the old practices kind of clicked in and the intellectual property rights that the, the companies treasure uh, and uh, they say they need that in order to generate income to produce the, the medicines for the future. But what that, uh, that intellectual property law does, it really restricts the manufacturing of the vaccines and, and puts it into the hands of the, uh, or keeps it in the hands of the vaccine companies. And that's really problematic when you are trying to do the sort of thing that we are trying to do now, which is vaccinate the entire world. And that situation, rather than improving, I think, over the, over the uh, pandemic, has actually got worse because, for a couple of reasons. One is the uh, COVID, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 has mutated along the way, and it's given us new variants which are much more transmissible and one of the things that means is that you require very, very high level of uh, population vaccination in order to get the sort of population immunity that we see from things like uh, like measles and, and, mm -hmm. and so on, which are and measles getting close to elimination in very many countries. 
but that means that you've got to have really high levels. Now we know it, it and I know from running um, vaccination immunization uh, campaigns in Britain and, uh, and in Ireland over the years, you can easily get to, to 60, 70% without any difficulty of your target audience, but getting it up into the 80s to the 90s, really, really tough. So things have got tough. And uh, I think the thing that's made it most tough just recently is uh, the confirmation that the immunity generated by many of the vaccines does win with time. And we're getting that information largely from Israel, which was a, a country in the forefront of uh, the vaccination effort. And uh, that has meant that very many places are uh, already planning to use up some of the contractual um, agreements that they have with vaccine companies to produce vaccines to produce a third shot for mm. their population. And that again restricts um, supply to developing countries and it increases prices. You can see the prices going up uh, around the world as this requirement for boosters has become more apparent. So if we go back just to the idea of patents, I mean, you, you could understand the pressure on countries to now be producing vaccines for you know, a, a, a third vaccination. Um, so you can understand that well, naturally all governments are gonna try and to, to want to vaccinate their own populations. But the idea of lifting the patent would enable countries, enable regions around the world to produce those vaccines. So you wouldn't have yes. this sort of vaccine nationalism taking place. Can, can we just focus on why hasn't that worked so far? If the United States, surely the biggest and most powerful voice you know, in terms of both patents and also lobbying people in purely in terms of political pressure, why hasn't that come into effect? It is really interesting. So on the one side you have, and, and the idea was really, uh, I think, promoted heavily. Uh, its most Im important backers were the, the nation states of India, South Africa and Brazil behind it. And the US rowing in behind, I thought that was going to be the game changer and we would see movement. But Europe hasn't played ball with that and the UK, uh, which is no longer part of the European Union and the European Union, uh, have both stuck with the, uh, I suppose, the pharmaceutical company's position, which is that, that should those patents should, remove, uh, should remain in place rather than be relaxed to allow mm. increased ca capacity. And I think that's, I think that's a, a terrible indictment of Europe and, and, and the UK and their approach to, to world health. And it also is a failure on their behalf to understand the nature of COVID-19, the nature of, of, of pandemics. Uh, so, and that's because, just very quickly, one, it, it, the more cases there are around the world, the more chance we have of even worse mutations coming forward. And uh, you can, we're not safe until we're all safe. And the, the, I, I think that, uh, and, and the second big driver is, of course, it, for, uh, it, it's quite clear now that some of these vaccines are going to be the most profitable pharmaceutical products ever in the history of mankind. And I think there's a really big profit motive that lies right at the back of all this. Right. OK. Um, I was just reading the, the Financial Times saying that the people doing the negotiations, principally between the US and the European Union, um, essentially the EU officials on the negotiation side, I'm sorry, it's the summer holidays. Um, we've got to pack off and pack up and, you know, go off on, um, and go home. Um, and those, so those negotiations really stopped in July and could have gone through August and they're only going to resume in September, um, which doesn't seem to me to be <laughs> the way to be handling a, a pandemic. It's absolutely horrendous. Um, let, let, let's shift um, slightly. Um, Katerina Katidi, you, you're a, you work with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, um, High Commissioner for Refugees. So your remit really is to talk about refugees. And I think this is... Um, it's very interesting because it's reflective of a obviously a very marginalized group of, of within society. And so I'm interested to get your overall perspective and then some concrete examples of what's happening to these groups. So just overall, I mean, I think I think you see the pandemic in sort of three different aspects of it. And you, you were I think we were talking about this earlier um, in terms of um, the, the economic impact, the health impact um, and um, the, the, you know, also in terms of protection as well. 
thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, just to uh, begin, I would like to say that I agree actually fully with Gabriel. And uh, on the issue, starting from the issue of um, uh, inequitable uh, um, access to vaccines across the world, this is clearly something that affects the forcibly displaced populations, the refugees, those who had to flee their countries because of uh, uh, persecution, uh, conflict or violation of uh, human rights. There are, uh, by the end of, this, uh, of last year, uh, we measured, uh, we counted 82.4 million forcibly displaced people around the world. And we know that nine out of 10 among them live in developing states. But at the same time, we know that 73% uh, uh, of all vaccine doses have been administered in just 10 countries. And that a bit less than 20% of all vaccinations, of all vaccines have been administered in low and middle income countries. So we we see that uh, this um, uh, inequitable uh, access to vaccines between countries is clearly affecting the areas where refugee populations are, are living, and it is um, leaving basically these poorer countries at the mercy of the virus. We know that the virus doesn't know any borders. We know that, as Gabriel mentioned, no one is safe until everybody is safe. And we just cannot let uh, refugees, asylum seekers and other groups uh, at this uh, situation. Indeed, what uh, we are uh, observing uh, on, on the ground is that uh, the socioeconomic situation of refugees has gotten a lot worse uh, due to the pandemic, and uh, this is uh, 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 based. Uh, this is because of uh, various factors. Uh, one of them is that they already start uh, um, by uh, being uh, uh, poorer, uh, living in more uh, marginalized communities in their vast majority. But also because many of them, around 60%, were working in employments that were uh, more deeply affected by the virus, uh, like for example. Um, the accommodation sector or the tourist sector, uh, the um, uh, um, uh, uh, hospitality, let's say, mm. uh, industry in many cases. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, their livelihoods uh, have been uh, uh, very much uh, uh, at risk. Uh, uh, also because uh, a big part of them uh, work, uh, works in, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, unofficial, let's say, part of the economy, economy yeah. uh, or is based on remittances uh, in order to survive which uh, have also uh, gotten down because of the pandemic. Their health situation also uh, is uh, more vulnerable uh, in comparison to the local population uh, which hosts them uh, because they usually live in more crowded places in uh, uh, camps uh, across the world or uh, in uh, poorer uh, neighborhoods in uh, urban environments. Uh, so uh, these uh, uh, were uh, two uh, main aspects uh, that uh, we are focusing on. And uh, where, we see, uh, where we see that uh, uh, the effect has been so grave uh, that has increased uh, uh, a despair uh, across many, many parts of the refugee population. Uh, uh, you mentioned some concrete examples, and we saw that uh, in Uganda, uh, one of the biggest uh, hosting uh, country of refugees in the world, uh, the level of despair has been so grave that uh, the number of suicides sites among people uh, has uh, uh, increased among the refugee population. Uh, this also has to do uh, with the protection aspect uh, of uh, the crisis. The fact that uh, COVID-19 had an effect on the protection that uh, uh, refugees across uh, the world can have, like, for example, the protection from uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, there was an increase uh, recorded in the Uganda setting, which is uh, uh, given, uh, 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 which is as, as per our analysis, uh, mm. also linked to this uh, increase in suicides. Uh, I, I do want to mention some statistics, and, and these are, I think, from the Mel World Bank um, and um, Reuters, and they talk about 40.8% um, of the world population having received at least one dose of uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so that's 40.8% of the world population. Um, uh, a vaccination rate of 31.2 million a day. So that's pretty significant, but wait for this one here. Only 1.9% of people in low income countries have received at least one dose. So that's that's really quite a stark, a stark contrast. Coming back just specifically to the refugee situation, and this is this is a sort of an anomaly, um, Katerina, which is 
you you want refugees to have the freedom of movement. So if you're freeing, fleeing a conflict situation, you're saying it, you have to maintain the international right of a refugee to flee and basically be, be accepted to be able to travel across the border. But obviously during the pandemic, people's reactions has been to close borders. Exactly, this was the case. Uh, although we saw that uh, uh, the numbers of um, of refugees did not uh, uh, decline, I mean, uh, people uh, uh, continue to flee borders in order to seek safety uh, during the pandemic. We know that at the height of uh, of the pandemic, uh, up to 100 countries have uh, had uh, closed their borders uh, to everyone, making no exception to refugees. And even now, currently, there are 49 countries where access to territory uh, is denied uh, because uh, um, uh, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, what uh, we have seen, though, is other uh, in other environments, is uh, uh, an uh, enormous effort, a commendable effort by states to keep their borders open. And these states have actually showed that it is possible both to fulfil your moral and legal obligation to provide access to territory to people that are fleeing for their lives, but mm. also to keep your population safe, to uh, protect the health of uh, both uh, those fleeing and the people who will uh, um, uh, who will host them. Like, for example, by uh, having uh, increased testing at the border for the uh, uh, population that comes, or by uh, installing quarantine uh, for uh, for those that reach your territory. So the one does not exclude. The other this is not uh, uh, a black and white situation mm. okay um but more broadly you said in, in principle all the countries that have these refugee populations have accepted um that, that, that they should be given uh, vaccinations and you're saying by and large they are being given vaccinations it's just that because these are developing countries and the areas in which they're in the availability of vaccines are very very small uh, exactly. This is the case um, in uh, uh, the vast majority of the 153 countries uh, that uh, UNHCR is monitoring. We have seen that they have uh, uh, included uh, the um, uh, refugee populations in their vaccination plans. And in many of them, in tens of them, uh, refugees have also been included in the rollout of uh, Can, of can you give us examples of where this hasn't been taking place, where the, the situation is particularly bad in terms of access to vaccine? Just very briefly a concrete example. Uh, uh, there are several places where we see difficulties, but uh, uh, one key thing to remember is that these difficulties are not only due uh, to the inability of the state to do uh, uh, rather the unwillingness of the state to include the refugees in the rollout. Uh, there are also some practical uh, barriers uh, that uh, we are witnessing, which are also easier to overcome. Like, for example, some states uh, do require um, uh, specific uh, identification papers in order to include mm. the refugees in the vaccination process. Or uh, they do the information sharing about the areas where the vaccine can be uh, received in a language that the refugees cannot understand. So there is a lack of uh, uh, translation and interpretation. Uh, we see also uh, that uh, sometimes the vaccination rollout requires a type of literacy, like computer literacy, that may be unavailable to refugee, refugee populations. Other times, there are uh, costs uh, um, uh, implied, uh, not necessarily in order to get the vaccine, which uh, in the vast majority of cases is provided free of charge, but uh, because uh, the refugees uh, need to take uh, um, uh, a leave uh, of absence from their work. They need to pay a fare uh, to transport themselves uh, uh, for a very long distance, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay. so, and I think this is, this is common for many people in, in poor populations. In a moment, we'll come to Paul Davis, because I know South Africa has um, a lot of experience with this, of dealing with, with marginalized populations or very poor populations, and how do you get access to them? How do you enable them to get access to the vaccine? But Gabriel, I want to come back to you just in purely in terms of, uh, of enabling the vaccine distribution to take place. You talked about some of the lobbying that has been taking place, um, uh, the, both from pharmaceutical companies, but also others as well. Can you just say a bit more about that? What, what ha we, we understand you've talked about the difference between the EU and the US, but what about more on the sort of commercial side of things? Well, I think uh, you are talking about companies which have an enormous clout in some, in some jurisdictions and have uh, real, real influence and are very well tied into a sort of medical industrial complex. And uh, 
therefore they have very, very good connections to the center of government and a great deal of influence. And they have used those uh, to, to, to lobby. I think what is most disappointing is that we haven't seen uh, the funders of uh, a lot of the vaccine research, uh, both the state funders and the philanthropic funders actually exerting their influence. And the politicians, I, I, I've been very disappointed, I think, in many of the politicians who have put the interests of their own population above the interests of the, of the global population. And we, we've seen that even at a very, uh, a very small level, the lack of cooperation between Northern Ireland in the UK and the Republic mm -hmm. of Ireland, an independent country, and, and a refusal uh, from Northern Ireland to share any of their vaccines with the Republic of Ireland when the Republic of Ireland had, had zero. And uh, some of that vaccine nationalism, it is, is called, is driven by the politicians, but it also plays into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. And you can, you can see that by watching the prices of the, of the vaccines and the way they've changed. And, and, and there are, I've got colleagues who watch this all the time and, and, and they can see it moving alongside the statements coming from countries being for or against the, the, the patent laws or for the, when uh, certain countries uh, adopt a, a policy of boosters and heading towards annual boosters potentially, which would tie up a tremendous amount of the, the capacity. And that generates higher prices, generates more profits, uh, for the industry. And we have all of this unused vaccine production capacity across the world and shortages of some of the key components uh, that we're not, uh, we, we're, we're not taking advantage of. And I think it calls into question some of our international bodies and the role of the World Health Organization as well, which has not, uh, I think, accredited its, uh, accredited itself well, you know, come out of this well mm. uh, as an international organization. And it has behaved much more as an intergovernmental organization representing the interests of its member states and uh, listening to its member states rather than its overall purpose, which should be on behalf of the world population, protecting the world population. But, I mean, Gabriel, you, I mean, I, I can agree with you, but in a way, I mean, it's, it's idealistic as well. And you can understand that governments respond to their electorates and the electorates are not going to allow them to stick around for long if they don't vaccinate their own populations first. I, and I think governments have a duty to explain to their population about the world situation. I, I, in my experience, uh, when you explain to the population the needs of people internationally and the fact that uh, older vulnerable people are dying in countries who can't get hold of any vaccine where we're thinking about boosters for people we're thinking about uh, expanding the age range now i'm arguing for all of those things and it's a very difficult argument uh, you know i i argue for um uh, the vaccination of people uh, because the, the licensing for some of the vaccines is now from 12 upwards, and I argue for that. And uh, I, I'm, I, the, the counter argument to that is, oh, well, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be sending the vaccines elsewhere. But we get into this sort of charitable notion then that uh, d uh, less prosperous countries have to live off the crumbs of the table of the rich countries. And, and that's, I, I think that's a disgraceful situation uh, to put ourselves in. The reason we got rid of smallpox, the reason why we're still on the verge of getting rid of polio and when we've got so many infectious diseases under control is because we acted as an international community, not groupings of nation states. Well, thank you both very much for your sort of introductions and, and overview there. I want to bring in Paul Davis now, who's got um, a great experience of, of working in South Africa, which has had a long history of dealing with communicable disease. Paul, you've been listening to the conversations here. I'd, I'd love to get a perspective on what has been happening in South Africa, but also your view in terms of the sort of global approach to this and perhaps your critique of that. Paul, if you, you just need to open your microphone. I think I'll wait for, wait for Paul there for a second. I know that Paul has had, Paul is just on his phone um, there. Um, so I'm just going to give him a second to see if he can if he can come back in. So while he's waiting there, um, Gabriel, while, while we're waiting for Paul just to come back, the, you've, it's not just the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, you're quite conservative when it comes to the idea of lockdowns. You really think that countries have a responsibility to try and stop the outbreak within its place. So hang on, here we have Paul. Go ahead. Paul. Can you? Right. Hi. Go ahead, Paul. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for uh, 
uh, this participation. It's been a very interesting discussion. Um, I, in the main, internationally, I agree with Gabriel. I, I must say that it's exactly how, how, how we see it. But there are issues around the devil in the detail, certainly in South Africa. And if I could say that the, we've got quite a big, um, not quite refugees, but uh, people who've come into the country from other countries, particularly Zimbabwe and the Congo, who have not registered themselves with the, with the government here to make themselves either refugees or to get permission to remain. And although the president has um, stipulated that no one will be denied uh, the vaccine, um, these refugees, um, I can't say refugees, but these people just will not present themselves to any uh, authority because they have to give some kind of identification from the perspective of the follow-up regarding the the double the, to the two vaccines so we're, t we're talking about mi essentially migrants here they might have an argument they yeah. might have a, a claim on refugee status but essentially so, you're, you're i i guess you're saying in many cases um that their their fear is that they they're going to be expelled because they're going to be seen as economic migrants no i think that's exactly right and uh, they've remained unregistered migrants for a long time and this exp may expose them to being having to register and then having maybe to be sent back to their country. So that there's a, a, a quite a, and there are quite a lot. There's about four, four or five million we estimate of those immigrants in South Africa that are not registered. That's, um, a, huge, so that's, that's a huge number. Yeah, that's a huge number. yeah, it is. It is, and so that compounds that particular problem. Uh, the problem is the other one that is prevalent in South Africa is that a recent study showed that about 30% of the home care uh, uh, givers um, are against the vaccine or completely ambivalent about it. So it's almost impossible for them or impossible for people to get good advice as regarding the vaccine uh, to, to take it because the, the healthcare worker, uh, for whatever reason, and we're not sure exactly, I mean, you, there, there are mm. a million reasons why, but it's a big problem. So people are just not appearing at, at vaccination centers, particularly in, in more, the more rural areas. Um, they, there's enough vaccine. There wasn't for some months enough vaccine and it was a protocolized uh, staged uh, vaccination system but right now they are it's been open to everyone over the age of 18. Mm. Um, and just and to say Orem the charity you work with has been involved in helping to vaccinate people in more remote and um, rural communities also the government has set up um, vaccination centers in the township so um, that people within those communities have got uh, relatively good access to them. So sure. that 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 situation, in terms of the government's efforts and attempts to roll out the vaccine, it's been it's been fairly impressive. Yes, I think I think it's been good, and people and certainly organisations have come together to make vaccine facilities uh, pretty pretty reasonable. And if we've only vaccinated about 14 million people out of a population of 60 million with the object of trying to get to about 30 million uh, by November, December. Um, uh, but so it's, that, it's, that's, it's, very, that's very low, isn't it? That's very, yeah, very low. It's, it's, it's yeah. low. And the target uh, is about 300, the target is 300 vaccinations a day, um, but we're falling far short of that. And if you look at the numbers, they're 180 to maybe 240,000 vaccinations. So the, the whole process is being delayed. Um, just by non-attendance and um, I think a very poor PR program, um, and which, is, which has been bedeviled by um, recent, uh, the recent rioting in KwaZulu-Natal, mm. uh, the suspiciousness of, of, of many people about government's intention, um, and then genuine suspicion about uh, you know, all the, all the, the, the fake, fake news about the, the problems that may particularly in, in suspicious and um, superstitious communities, uh, vaccinations are, are, are not seen as some, some benign uh, savior. Uh, yes. they, 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 pre they represent some kind of danger to them. Yeah. Paul, thank you very much indeed for your, for your contributions here. I'm keen to get questions from people around the world, so please do put your questions in the Q&A box there. We've got a, 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 a diverse areas of discussion. We're talking about 
um, public health messaging, I think, and um, I'd love to come back to Katrina and, and Gabriel about that. Um, in terms, we've been talking about the distribution and then also the access to, to, to different communities, especially in, in, in poorer areas. Um, Gabe, we've just come back to come back to you. You said you've been critical of, of the WHO acting more like an intergovernmental organization. What do you expect of the, the world's nation in terms of trying to push this vaccination, vaccination um, you know, layout or distribution? Well, I would, I would hope that we would have a World Health body uh, that would be uh, talking directly to the governments and putting a policy position to the governments and inviting them to join it uh, in changing this. And I, I mean, we are in a very difficult position with the World Health Organization. It is underfunded. There's no doubt about it. It has had major crises, including the withdrawal of uh, the US uh, threatened withdrawal of membership and funding. It has a, a lot of debt of unpaid uh, subscriptions from member organizations and for its core activities, really core activities, uh, core programs, uh, it's been dependent for years upon uh, a few governments who gener generously give a lot of additional money. So it's, it, it's really an enfeebled organization. And I think also our international health regulations, which have only relatively recently been redrawn and, and put through legislation across, across the world, haven't, haven't been up to scratch in terms of dealing with issues such as quarantine uh, and dealing with some of the really difficult issues that Katerina is, is talking about, uh, the rights of refugees, uh, the rights of poorer populations. Um, and in opposition to the World Health Organization, we've seen the international airline industry really taking a very aggressive stance in some countries where they have a great deal of influence uh, to try and make sure that uh, um, airlines can operate unaffected by issues such as quarantine and so on. So it's been a really uh, difficult situation for our international relations. The European Commission as well, I think, has been in some difficulty. They don't have a competency uh, in, in terms of their responsibilities, a very limited comp comp uh, competency on, on health and public health. And they haven't really lived up to that. And when some European countries have decided to place uh, mm -hmm. restrictions on travel or restrictions on entry, they've been uh, told off by the European Commission for having done so, even though those countries were acting to prevent the spread of the virus. And th they have a definition of uh, freedom of movement, which is basically an economic definition, and they say that, well, that trumps public health. And I, yeah, Gabriel, I, there are going to be some people watching this who are going to say, look, we're a year and a half into it. There are va vaccines are being being rolled out and it's not ideal, but the world has to get back to work. And we could take the, the example in South Africa. Um, and I'm sure Katerina could talk about the same thing, too, with refugee populations where people need to work from day to day. They need to get out. They need to move down. And so you can't have perpetual lockdowns. And in, in, in many cases, it, you should you should be able to move across borders because your, your economic livelihood depends upon it. In fact, the world's livelihoods depend upon it. And the economy is so important. You'll not find a public health uh, physician like me who would say that the, the economy and people's ability to earn money and the distribution of that money are vital issues. And when you look at the record across this 18 months, it is the countries that have controlled the virus uh, most effectively that have, have seen their economies preserved. Uh, and it's the ones that have made a really terrible job of dealing with the virus that have suffered the economic damage. And uh, Nicholas, one of the things we haven't really talked about is prevention. We've been talking a lot about vaccination, but it's got to be We've got to have a strategy which is also about prevention, and that's dealing with some of the big issues of prevention about enclosed spaces, about proper ventilation, about workers' rights. It's completely changed the whole definition of workers' rights in terms of fresh air, uh, th their right in a place of employment to be provided with fresh air. And, and, and uh, COVID has changed all that definition, and we're not dealing with those really fundamental pre preventive measures that can help, that can help us all. And I, I think uh, one of the things that will come out of this for me is I've seen so many countries who are putting all their eggs in the one basket. And at, at the moment, that one basket is vaccination. And, you know, Nicholas, the thing that keeps me awake at night is we could just so easily have a new variant comes up that could, dis that, that could get past a very substantial proportion of the immunity granted by the current vaccinations. 
uh, available. But that could happen. And the only way that we can really stop that is by getting the virus under control. To do that, we need vaccinations, but we also need a really strong concentration on, on prevention. And WHO and other um, organizations have been very poor at recognizing that it's an airborne disease uh, and, and deeply criticized they have been for continuing to talk about droplet spread and all the, the, the hand washing and sanitizing and so on, all that uh, sanitary theater, some people call it, and not talking about the serious issue about preventing airborne spread. Uh, just briefly, Katerina, do you have a, um, a policy on that very last thing on in terms of airborne um, spread and prevention? I mean, we, we on our um, study tours around the world have been have visited charities working with Syrian refugees, other refugee populations, for example, in Colombia as well. Um, do, do you have a policy on that? Does that, does that take place country by country? Uh, what I can say about prevention uh, is that uh, we also uh, cannot highlight uh, enough its importance. I mean, vaccination uh, is uh, needs to be part of a broader policy, uh, a broader um, a group of uh, measures that will allow us to put uh, uh, the virus ultimately under control. Uh, just like uh, the measures in order to tackle COVID-19 on their own uh, should not be the only focus uh, um, uh, when we are looking uh, at the issues of uh, refugee and uh, uh, asylum seekers uh, health. Uh, we need uh, Oh, we saw, in order to give you an example, that uh, last year, malaria continued to be uh, the biggest killer of refugees. Uh, this was the uh, key cause of, of uh, refugee deaths uh, around the world. So uh, keeping uh, the eye on the ball, keeping uh, COVID in focus while doing that, we need to also work in order to support uh, the more vulnerable countries financially, politically, and technically in order to ensure that there are health systems that are strong enough to fight all such challenges for the refugee and the host populations alike. And, and I'm presuming that re in terms of um, average ages among, AG, um, among refugee populations, it's generally going to be a lot younger than you know, developed Western nations, for example. Uh, oh, what I can tell you is about um, uh, refugee children, for example, uh, that uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, a big part of the population of the refugee population are under the age of uh, of 18. Yes. Right. OK, got it. So in, in a way, you're saying this is, you know, COVID is just to repeat what you're saying is is um, one of many threats and, and not necessarily the most important. Let, let's bring in some some questions now. I've got Simon Jackson first and then I'll bring in Dave Roberts to ask a question off the back of that. So go ahead, Simon. Um, if just over 40% of the world population has now received at least one jab, what is a realistic aspiration by when and what needs to change to make it happen? Go ahead, Gabriel, and then we'll come to Dave Roberts. Yeah, a really easy question there. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think um, I, off the top of my head, if I was putting together a target, I would go for a target of uh, 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 of sections of the population. So I would say that across the world, we should be aiming to get uh, 80, 90% of the population over the age of 60 and population with uh, serious underlying uh, conditions, uh, clinically vulnerable people vaccinated by the end of this year. Um, that would reduce very substantially the, the death toll. So did you just repeat those figures again, uh, Gabriel? What were the I, would, I, I mean, this is entirely off the top of my head. I would say 90% of the world's population who are over the 60 years or older, and uh, also the people who have, uh, are clinically vulnerable, who have serious underlying conditions, vaccinated by the end of this year. That would be a good global target. And then move to trying to get that level of vaccination for the entire population. Had these good targets been set? I mean, in, in a moment, we've got COP26. The, the world's leaders are coming to Glasgow to talk about you know, um, global warming, and that's obviously taken very, very seriously. But this just doesn't seem to be the same um, not, coordination. Not seen, no, Nicholas, not that I have seen. And I, I may have missed something, but I, I haven't seen that approach. Now, that is based on that's based on reduction of mortality, which is the, the issue that's you know, kind of in our face, the, the, those tragic avoidable uh, premature deaths. But there is also the issue of long COVID, which doesn't get much discussion globally uh, or in many countries. And the, the number of people who are being disabled either for 
uh, a significant period of time or indefinitely. We still don't know what ha will happen to long COVID in the longer term. And uh, that prevention of disability uh, is an argument I think that is used particularly in developed countries as to why they uh, shouldn't share the vaccine, but they should keep it to uh, vaccinate their own population as well. So it, it is a complex issue. And at the back of it all, I uh, really feel for children in all of this. And I think uh, we are in the situation in some countries where they're not vaccinating children. They're saying that it's okay for children to get the virus. It's safer to uh, let them get the virus than to be vaccinated. That's certainly the position in the UK. Uh, I disagree with that fundamentally, and I go back to some of my learning as a young public health doctor about the flu pandemic uh, at the beginning, the Spanish flu at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and what happened in the US afterwards was that there was a, an epidemic of Parkinson's disease some years afterwards, very closely linked to the, that pandemic flu. And we know this dangerous COVID-19 virus affects the brain and it affects it badly. And I'm deeply, deeply against getting children infected with a, uh, a virus that, that, can, that has been shown to affect the brain and we don't know what the long-term consequences, which all plays to what Katerina was saying about the necessity of having a, 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 a and I was saying, a, a strategy that's based both on vaccination, but is also based on control, the control measures, but also the necessary local public health infrastructure in every country to be able to put those messages uh, and, and those programs into effect, and particularly this issue of uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, that Paul was talking about in, in South Africa. You have to have local public health visions who can work within communities and with community leaders, with faith leaders, and tackle some of the misconceptions and some of the misleading uh, membership uh, 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 messaging that's going on. And I just know from running campaigns, you can get up to a reasonable level of vaccination, but to get it up to as high as we need it now, it requires that sort of dedicated effort and public health systems are not strong across the world. Right, okay. Can you just repeat with that linkage between the, the pandemic uh, in, in 1919, oh, yeah. 1918, and then Parkinson's? That's something I didn't know about. Yeah, it's really interesting. As you know, the, uh, the, the pan, the, the, that Spanish flu pandemic was at its worst in the United States. Now it may well have been very bad in other countries, but it's documented uh, so well in the United States and the reaction to it was so uh, uh, so important as uh, in, in, in society there. But some time after, years after, not many years, they started to see a real spike in cases of Parkinson's disease. And that went on for some time and that was very closely linked to people who had been through uh, getting the virus during the pandemic and living through that period. And that what and then it then it uh, tailed off over the years, and that was very. You're, you're basically saying it's vascular damage, is that it? I uh, know it was it was uh, uh, brain damage. It was a yeah. damage to the functioning of, of the brain, and there has been a little hint of that in terms of COVID nineteen, both in terms of some cases of Parkinson's being um, precipitated by uh, the virus, but also some of the symptoms. You know, some of the basic symptoms about loss of taste and and, and smell show that it is uh, very active. The virus is active in the brain the brain fog that people who get long COVID talk about afterwards. And, and just the, the, the tremendous burden it puts on all the organ systems in the body. Mm. Okay, that's um, fascinating stuff. Um, Dave Roberts, interesting question here. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, uh, uh, Gabriel, I, I take some solace in, in the fact that you describe this as a complicated situation because as a a fairly ordinary person, I struggle with the limitations of our, our media to to obtain a, a an overview of what's happening in in the world. But I, I had two questions, and I hope they're not naive; they're related. Um, the first is, in providing its vaccine at cost, is it the case that AstraZeneca has set a, a lonely example to other pharmaceutical companies in making a distinction between people and profit? And the the second related question is has undermining the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine for what appear to be largely political reasons, um, hasn't that affected the ability of richer countries to help vaccinate poorer countries? 
I, I don't think those are new questions at all. In fact, they're very, they, they are very interesting questions, very difficult questions. Uh, I think the AstraZeneca vaccine, they did start with very good intention and uh, that was not to uh, make, make profit out of the acute pandemic. I'm not sure that those good intentions have made their way all the way uh, through, through uh, the last 18 months. Um, and, and there was, is a difficulty with uh, the AstraZeneca, vac two difficulties with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, which were reasonable questions to raise. One was uh, the, the, ident the issue that was identified fairly rapidly uh, of increased uh, blood clots in the brain, particularly in younger women, that led to uh, a lot of concern about its use and it not being used for some sections of the population, uh, particularly younger women. Now that creates a problem if you have to, uh, if you're buying vaccines, would you buy a vaccine which uh, can be used for everyone or would you buy one that's only uh, for part of the population? Um, I think uh, the other issue is its effectiveness against all of the all of the variants and, and South Africa was a case in point, I believe, uh, that the South Africa, the dominant variant in South Africa, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine was not so effective against uh, that. In fact, it was quite low. Uh, the level of effectiveness was comparatively low and it, it wasn't an appropriate vaccine for that. So I think there have been uh, some uh, difficulties around the vaccine. And of course it was made in a different way from the uh, Astra, uh, from the Pfizer vaccine, the, the modified RNA vaccines. So those are complicated issues. Uh, we will see many more vaccines of the same types uh, and different types coming forward. And I think they will all be, uh, have different characteristics, different uses, uh, and, and, but they all contribute to it. The, the problem is we haven't got enough of them. Um, just for people watching the UK, Gabriel is quite well known for some of his criticism of um, the UK government here and its approach. Um, Gabriel, just to for that, we've got lots of people um, w w watching from elsewhere who might not be so familiar with it. What is your critique of how Boris Johnson has handled it? Uh, quite often they, they say they're led by the science. Um, if for those who don't know what's been going on over here, and I know that you could go on for a long, long time, what has been your critique of, of how they've handled it over the last year? Well, I must say, I, I find myself in a very peculiar position. I used to be a, a senior civil servant in the Department of Health and at the centre of a lot of these discussions in the past. And uh, what I've seen uh, during the pandemic is... I, it, it's a surprise to me that the UK has handled so badly, having had such a death toll, an incredible death toll, and that, and that continues for Northern Ireland, part of the UK, currently has the highest death toll in, in, in Western Europe. And um, uh, partly it is because of their lack of a public health infrastructure and a general uh, reduction of the capacity of the state to respond. So. There used to be regional health authorities. There used to be regional government offices. There used to be regional development agencies. A lot of that infrastructure. Are you talking? So, what are we getting? Are we talking about um, prevention or treatment? Are we just talking about the, the fact that the government has opened up the economies so many times and then slammed uh, the brakes on them? All of the all of the aforementioned. They they didn't put controls on to stop the virus being imported. Uh, they didn't. They decided to stop testing. At a time that WHO was saying test, 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 they decided to stop testing in the communities and trying to track uh, cases. They set up a really field uh, test and trace system that didn't test in accordance with the international guidance. It didn't test the people at highest risk, uh, those who had been close contacts. It just told people to isolate. It used uh, social restriction too late. Um, they waited until uh, to use Boris Johnson's uh, phrases about bodies piling up, they waited until the bodies piled up and then they put social restrictions in to get it down again. And as soon as they went down again, they lifted again. They've invested almost nothing in prevention. There is no program of improving ventilation in workplaces. Mask wearing has come and gone. They've never really adopted to it being an airborne disease rather than droplet spread. Uh, the messaging it has not been clear and has not been consistent. And it, and it goes on today with the UK being a, a country that, that unlike most of the other countries that have ac access to Pfizer, including the US where they've uh, immunized, vaccinated, uh, I think about 10 million young people, uh, the UK doesn't vaccinate anyone between the age of 12 and 16, even though 
the vaccine has been approved for its safety by the regulatory body here. Uh, they're not doing so. And uh, I, 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 I find it, uh, it's a sorry tale from beginning to end. I think the only, the only thing that's gone really well is that uh, the, the, the vac a lot of the contribution to the development of vaccine took place from the UK and, and that bit has gone well. And the rollout has, of the vaccination, such as it is, has gone really well until it gets to, uh, we're up uh, in the 70 to 80% of the eligible population. But we need to get up into 80 to 90% of the entire population before that will be effective. And we're not, it has stalled the, the vaccination. Yeah, as, you, as, as things stand, how do you see the, as we're going into the autumn here, the Northern Hemisphere, um, Delta, is, the Delta variant is, is you know, prevalence running at very, very high um, numbers here. Yep. How do you see things? I mean, is it the fact that because we're vaccinated, there's not going to be, we can handle the death toll and politically that's acceptable? Well, if you can handle it, if the politicians think they can handle a death toll of doing 100, 200 a day, which is what it's running at the moment. Nicholas, if I took you back 18 months and there was an infectious disease appeared in the UK and it was killing 100 to 200 people, a day, everyone would be horrified. We'd be doing everything we could to prevent it. And uh, we're talking about living with that situation now. The real problem is the health service, the NHS, which is uh, a world respected organization, but has been impoverished over the years. It's short of staff. That hasn't been helped by Brexit, by the, uh, the numbers of people who've left and, and gone back to, uh, to their own countries because of Brexit and our inability to bring new people in easily. Uh, we've never trained enough doctors or nurses. We've, uh, from an international perspective, it's been, a, it's been disgraceful, I think. We've always relied on staffing our health service in, in the UK for as long as I can remember, on taking doctors trained by other countries, often countries who can ill afford to lose them. So uh, health service underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced in general, and un under a great deal of pressure, has been from the beginning under a great deal of pressure. And it's going to, it's looking like it could be a very, very rocky, rocky road. Cases are going up, deaths are going up slowly, uh, and the hospital admissions are, are going up. And I, I think it's, uh, it is remarkable. And the mm -hmm. most remarkable thing, Nicholas, I think is the policy position is that it is good to have people getting infected now, uh, going into hospital now and dying now. Uh, that that's actually been said by the chief medical officer. They he, they want that wave of infection to happen now, rather than happen in the autumn and the winter. But in fact, I think it is going to go on into the autumn uh, and, and winter. And I've never heard of a policy ever in my life where you don't act to prevent a preventable disease. You think it's good to get it over with? No. We that's what what people do. We stop people getting sick and uh, ill and dying. Well, um, th thank you, Gabriel. I, I will add that um, Gabriel came on at very, very short notice. Um, Claire Wenham uh, was pulled away by a call with the World Health Organization. And so we're very lucky to have Gabriel here and literally um, uh, just over an hour's <laughs> notice. So I'm very grateful for your time here. We're going to wrap up shortly in, in about five minutes or so. Uh, Katrine, I do want to, we've been talking there about the UK for, for quite a bit. Just before we leave, I know that um, the um, UNHCR and the World Bank has done a, a survey um, of eight different countries looking particularly at refugee populations. Can you just give us some of the, the highlights of the things you've you, you found? And I know this may come back to what you were saying earlier on in the discussion. Well, uh, uh, the key finding actually of the survey is uh, uh, what we already mentioned uh, in the beginning, that uh, the situation for refugees in many parts of the wor uh, world is uh, um, uh, far worse um, uh, than uh, uh, the host population. They are uh, in a, a rather more vulnerable uh, socioeconomic position. And uh, this is why uh, we should uh, uh, try to assist as much as possible uh, in uh, helping them save their lives and uh, supporting the, the host population uh, as well. Um, I was uh, listening very carefully the comments of the previous speaker. Uh, so if I may, I just want to add something to uh, what sure, Peter sure, sure. was saying. So he was mentioning the incidence uh, of uh, vaccine hesitancy in, uh, in South Africa. And a question that we receive very often is, uh, how about refugees? Uh, are they more or less uh, hesitant uh, as communities to, to, to be vaccinated? Uh, of course, um, the issue there is that uh, we are not uh, readily able to give this answer uh, because um, uh, um, 
in many areas, refugees uh, weren't actually able to have a choice yet. Uh, they uh, weren't presented with the possibility yet to, uh, to get the vaccine in order to, um, uh, uh, to negate, to, to deny uh, the vaccination. Uh, but uh, sensitization of refugee communities is also uh, very much uh, on our mind. And what we have seen is that uh, the tactic that works best is inclusion. Uh, and uh, bringing them uh, together uh, in uh, the sensitization journey, making them, sitting with them, understanding exactly what are the concerns, uh, which are the reasons why they don't uh, want some of them to, to, to be vaccinated, and uh, using uh, working together with refugees themselves in order to speak to the, to, to the rest of the community. Uh, so uh, inclusion is the word for us, uh, mm -hmm. both in fighting uh, the communication uh, uh, war, if uh, we can uh, call it like that, uh, but also in all aspects, in uh, inclusion within countries, in, uh, inclusion uh, and equitable access to vaccines uh, uh, whenever we're talking about the international uh, situation. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Catherine. Just, uh, Gabriel, just to, to wrap up with you, it would seem to me, I've talked about, uh, we're still talking about COVID a year and a half into the pandemic, I'm betting that we're going to be talking about it still in a year's time from now. I think your money would be very safe if you bet that way. I think uh, it's going to be with us for, for years. Uh, very quickly, if I could say, Nicholas, you know, this isn't new to us. We've dealt with the, the flu, uh, the Spanish flu. I grew up in one of the poorest communities in, in the UK, in, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And uh, I went to a school that was built in 1933 as a result of the flu, but also tuberculosis pan pan uh, epidemic that there was at that time. And what we did, what Belfast did is rebuilt all its schools to make them uh, a sanitary example. So lots of ventilation, big high windows, lots of sunlight. And it, it, I think that sort of societal engineering to deal with the, this respiratory uh, pathogen, but also proofing us against respiratory pathogens in the future. I think there'll be a big hangover across all sectors of society, including the built environment and architecture, uh, um, society and schools and workplaces will all have to change. So we are going to be talking about this and its aftermath for a long time. It's fascinating, isn't it? If you think of um, the, the reaction to globalization was perhaps increased nationalism. And here we have a global pandemic that really calls for a, a global response, but as yet, we, we, it's, very, it's very hard to see that. We're going to wrap it up there. My thanks very much indeed to Katerina Katidi from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, also to Dr. Gabriel Scali from the Shadow Sage um, um, here in the UK, and also earlier to um, Dr. Paul Davis, who was talking about South Africa. Thank you all very much indeed.